Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. According to The New York Times, President Obama has been photographed kite surfing with Richard Branson off Necker Island, relaxing on David Geffen's yacht in French Polynesia with Bruce Springsteen and Oprah Winfrey, river rafting with his family in Bali, and posing with a celebrity chef in Tuscany. To those who have paid only casual attention to former President Barack Obama's foreign travel since he left the White House in January 2017, it can seem as if Mr. Obama has been on an extended vacation of the kind only the very rich can afford. That's from the New York Times. Well, in his speech giving the 2018 Nelson Mandela lecture, President Obama talked about the exclusive company he now keeps. In every country, just about. The disproportionate economic clout of those at the top has provided these individuals with wildly disproportionate influence on their country's political life and on its media, on what policies are pursued and whose interests end up being ignored. Now, it should be noted that this new international elite, the professional class that supports them, differs in important respects from the ruling aristocracies of old. It includes many who are self-made. It includes champions of meritocracy. And although still mostly white and male, as a group, they reflect a diversity of nationalities and ethnicities that would have not existed a hundred years ago. A decent percentage consider themselves liberal in their politics, modern and cosmopolitan in their outlook, unburdened by parochialism or nationalism or overt racial prejudice or strong religious sentiment. They are equally comfortable in New York or London or Shanghai or Nairobi or Buenos Aires or Johannesburg. Many are sincere and effective in their philanthropy. Some of them count Nelson Mandela among their heroes. Some even supported Barack Obama for the presidency of the United States. And by virtue of my status as a former head of state, some of them consider me as an honorary member of the club. You know, I get invited to these fancy things, you know. They'll fly me out. <laughs> but what's nevertheless true is that in their business dealings, many titans of industry and finance are increasingly detached from any single locale or nation state. They live lives more and more insulated from the struggles of ordinary people in their countries of origin. And their decisions, their decisions to shut down a manufacturing plant or to try to minimize their tax bill by shifting profits to a tax haven with the help of high-priced accountants or lawyers, or their decision to take advantage of lower-cost immigrant labor, or their decision to pay a bribe are often done without malice. It's just a rational response they consider to the demands of their balance sheets and their shareholders and competitive pressures. But too often these decisions are also made without reference to notions of human solidarity. President Obama is a member of the meritocracy he refers to and has earned his way into this top tier of elites who have such enormous clout in determining the fate of peoples. This speech was a defense of the system that gave him such power and prestige, a defense of global capitalism. It's an important speech, I think, because it lays out what Obama sees as the achievements of globalization, which he thinks are many. He sees the great inequality that has been produced and the rise of the populist right, and says that the solution to these problems is more global capitalism, but one that's more enlightened and inclusive. 
Joining me to discuss Obama's speech is Professor Leo Panitch, Professor, of, Professor Emeritus of York University and co-author of The Making of Global Capitalism, The Political Economy of American Empire, and editor of the Socialist Register. The next issue is titled, A World Turned Upside Down. Thanks for joining us, Leo. Glad to be here, Paul. Great topic. So, Leo, in, in the segment of the speech we played, Obama's talking about the liberal elites, also known in political terms as corporate Democrats, the elites that back the Clintons and Obama, people who see their decisions as a rational response to the demands of shareholders and competitive pressures, as Obama put it. I'm sure he sees his own policies in the same light. Yet the global system is increasingly irrational, and it was Obama's supposed rational policies that helped create the inequality that fueled the rise of the extremist, climate crisis-denying, neo-fascist Trump in the first place. <laughs> so, Leo, the decay of the system seems to be speeding up and the political crisis seems to reflect it. Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, you know, one, one has to say he says that himself. Uh, and and uh, he is identifying the decay of the system very explicitly. Uh, so, you know, where does one do with this kind of speech? Uh, on the one hand, uh, you say he's hanging out with Springsteen, and you maybe we need to see him like Springsteen. Uh, we need to see him as a singer, uh, as a speech maker, and as a speech compared with most politicians' speeches these days. This one uh, has a lot of substance. Um, uh, you know, whether one agrees with it all or not, this is, you know, for a politician, a pretty, pretty intellectually impressive uh, uh, piece of work. Uh, so as with Springsteen, who after all appeared at his inauguration singing, this land is your land, bringing Pete Seeger, and explicitly keeping in the verse on private property. Um, there are elements of this speech. I entirely agree with the way you presented it and with his own uh, lack of honesty about his complicity. Uh, that said, there are elements in it that uh, can be used and used very powerfully. For instance, um, he says all of what you said, and he does play, praise globalization. Even worse, he very, uh, you know, apparently uncritically at the whole first half of the speech before he gets to globalization, presents the march of democracy, the struggles for national liberation, the winning of the welfare state, the winning of trade unions, etc., as the march of progress through history that brought us to a wonderful world. But even before he, he you know, says we're in decay, very few politicians who want to go back to, say, the Keynesian welfare state uh, to the 50s and 60s admit what he admitted which is that we have to start by admitting that whatever the laws were on the books, the previous structures of privilege and power and injustice and, get it, exploitation, uh, never completely went away. And he even earlier in the speech said, and that includes exploitation of whites uh, uh, by other whites, uh, and puts it more strongly than I'm putting it actually now. Uh, so he gives you something there. Uh, and he not only then does the diversity thing, which my prime minister, Justin Trudeau, is so full of in every sense of that word, he actually goes back to exploitation by saying that uh, workers in agriculture and manufacturing have been harmed by globalization, uh, that unions have lost their power, and that this is at the source of the vast growth and inequality. So the speech covers every base. He is and he has always been a politician that appeals across classes. That's very true. Um, and, and he certainly is appealing to the morality uh, of uh, the elites who he says do govern the world, and especially the economic elites, uh, saying to them, you know, how much can you consume? How big a house can you live in, uh, et cetera. Uh, appealing them to pay more taxes, to give back more in charity, et cetera. Uh, but essentially, he says, we need capitalism. Um, but we'd like a nice, humane capitalism. That said, in these elements of the speech, he gives us enough to see that those capitalists can never do this, that they will never give up their privilege and power, uh, 
that they are indeed dependent on this system in order to accumulate through exploitation and injustice. So it's a bit like Springsteen, who makes a lot of money and yes, you know, uh, goes off on these yachts himself, but gives us songs that we can sing. Yeah, I, I, the, the, the contradiction within his speech, and, and this is, it reminds me of something Bill Clinton did, which is Obama seems very aware of how this system works. Um, he has a big picture. I, I once saw, the reason I refer to Bill Clinton is when Chavez was at the United Nations and uh, did the I smell sulfur speech. Uh, Clinton happened to be in Toronto and a CBC interviewer asked him what he thought of Chavez's speech because it created such a kerfuffle here, uh, insulting George Bush, the president, in the United States, which a foreign dignitary in theory is not supposed to do. And, and Clinton said, well, you know, that was too much offending everyone like that. But he says Chavez could have given a critique of the kind of economic policies that the United States supported in Latin America. And then Clinton went on to give one of the best critiques of neoliberal economics and how it had <laughs> screwed up Latin America I've ever heard. A yeah. really good fact-based critique. Of course yeah. not saying these were his policies. I mean, yeah. these guys are very, very aware of how the system works. Very aware. Yet they, they are pragmatic. They are pragmatic and they decided as very young men open to the same type of influence as you and I were, Paul. They decided as very young men that you couldn't get out of this system. They, of course, also were highly ambitious. Uh, and that, with their ambition and their pragmatism, led them to uh, embrace a system in which there is this type of fundamental inequality of power and uh, attempt to, as, as he did as a, you know, as an, or, as an organizer of the poor in Chicago, what he used to do was he would bring poor women from the South Side into a boardroom where the elite of the Democratic Party establishment in Illinois would sit. He'd put them in a room. He'd say, work out a solution and walk out the door as if you could work out a solution that way. And they would throw some crumbs at those poor women. Okay, well, here's a segment of the speech where he outlines the great achievements of globalization and the inequality it produces. It's an example of how he, he gets both. And then we can talk about what he thinks should be done about it all. And with these geopolitical changes came sweeping economic changes. The introduction of market-based principles in which previously closed economies along with the forces of global integration powered by new technologies, suddenly unleashed entrepreneurial ta talents to those that once had been relegated to the periphery of the world economy, who hadn't counted, suddenly they counted, they had some power, they had the possibilities of doing business. And, and then came scientific breakthroughs and new infrastructure and the reduction of armed conflicts and suddenly a billion people were lifted out of poverty. And once starving nations were able to feed themselves, and, and infant mortality rates plummeted. And meanwhile, the spread of the internet made it possible for people to connect across oceans. And cultures and continents instantly were brought together and potentially all the world's knowledge could be in the hands of a small child in even the most remote village. And now an entire generation has grown up in a world that by most measures has gotten steadily freer and healthier and wealthier and less violent and more tolerant during the course of their lifetimes. Um. It's hard to know where to start with that. Uh, the, the <laughs> well, you see, he does it all. It's exactly what you were saying, Paul. He does it all. He lays it out in the bullshit terms uh, that the promoters of globalization uh, do, uh, speaking as though everyone became an entrepreneur rather than the vast majority of people became wage labor from having been independent commodity producers or peasants. 
Uh, he doesn't mention the fact that uh, the peasants who were producing corn in Mexico by virtue of NAFTA were driven across the border to become wage laborers in the United States and are now, of course, uh, the lobby fodder for Trump's claim that they're all rapists and murderers. Uh, uh, he doesn't say that. And yet a few paragraphs on, he provides the critique that we provide. Uh, in the same breath, without having gone back to the fact that they're not all entrepreneurs, that they became indeed uh, the people who were exploited by the entrepreneurs, whether those, and most of them were, multinational corporations, or whether they were rapacious local capitalists. But he gets precisely uh, the kind of critique we would make, which is not only that certain countries were left out, and that was certainly true, above all in Africa where he was speaking, and still is true, but it's true of regions within every country of the world, including within the United States, of course, which is one of the reasons Trump got elected. So he provides his own critique, and, and in that sense, one has to say uh, that, uh, you know, he is a politician of a rather unique kind. He doesn't bring it all together into the kind of critique of capitalism that is the only thing that can get us out of this. Uh, but he takes a step in that direction. Well, he himself, of course, will never lead it. Look, I have to admit, Paul, I think I've said this to you before, uh, and I may be a sucker for this more than I should be. When he made his speech, having won the Democratic nomination, uh, in in uh, 2008, and it was a phenomenal speech to the assembled masses of people in Chicago. He came back to Chicago. I was half expecting him to say, now don't go home. What you need to do is double your movement capacity, double your mobilization, increase your pressure, etc. Instead, what did he do? He said, thank you very much for putting me in this position. Uh, and uh, you can go home now. And, and that's the type of politician he is. One can fall for it, but it does give you certain language, a certain legitimacy for the kind of critiques we would want to make. You've got to excerpt pieces of the speech in order to do that, of course. I, I think the, the critical point here, and I know it's a point you've been making all through the Obama years and, and otherwise, the, the system itself is producing these conditions. So it's not like Obama's policies were the decisive element. It's a, in fact, the Obama policies are exactly kind of what he said, what he, he and his people saw as a rational response right. to the 0708 crisis. And why there's an 0708 crisis, he doesn't really want to dig into because the issue of the role of finance and financialization the owner of private ownership of these massive banks that have such dominance over the economy. Well, those are the forces that help elect Barack Obama in the first place. He, he exactly. wasn't, he he wasn't a, a Wall Street president, so he can't talk about why this stuff is happening. Well, he does say irresponsible bankers. He does, you know. It, but he I appointed mean, irresponsible bankers as his finance team. Well, no, well it, it is, look, as you said, it's systemic. Uh, the problem is systemic, uh, and the actions of those people within it are not so much evil, although they objectively are, they're not driven by a lack of sense of morality. They are driven indeed by the competitive nature of the system. And he goes so far to say uh, it is rational for them on their own terms to even be corrupt and to bribe, speaking in Africa, especially in South Africa, uh, uh, given Zuma has just been overturned. Uh, uh, you know, that's a big thing to say. Uh, he even sees that as an endemic part of the system. And it is. That's the whole point. And, of course, he becomes trapped in it. Uh, he not, becomes not, he's the product of it. He was a general manager of it. Yeah, and, and uh, was very much responsible uh, for containing the crisis. Uh, and insofar as you contain the crisis within capitalism, that means you do have to save the banks, which is what, of course, he did. 
Uh, now, he grumbled a couple of times to Wall Street bankers in the White House about having done so and earned their unending enmity just for grumbling to them that he had done so. Uh, you know, many of them were determined to get rid of him from 2011 on when he grumbled to them about you know, how they had ripped off the American government in order to be able to save the economy the world from a repeat of the Great Depression. So he, he is, in a sense, you're right, getting at the fact, even though he then won't carry it through, that the problem is systemic. That it isn't just a matter of the banks being too large. It's a matter of a dynamic global capitalism being dependent on having banks like this who can grease the wheels of international trade and production, who can invent things like derivatives so that you can use all the speculation that there is in the financial markets to make it possible for a Chinese firm to know when they sign a contract with Walmart in April, what the exchange rate will be in October when they deliver the jeans. And unless they know that, they won't be able to make a profit. So the system is indeed in its own terms, both chaotic and irrational, and nevertheless, all fitted together. And while globalization and technology have opened up new opportunities, have driven remarkable economic growth in previously struggling parts of the world, Globalization has also upended the agricultural and manufacturing sectors in many countries, has also greatly reduced the demand for certain workers, has helped weaken unions and laborers' bargaining power, has made it easier for capital to avoid tax laws and the regulations of nation states can just move billions, trillions of dollars with a tap of a computer key. He gives us a glimpse of that, having decided himself, as you said, that he is going to live with it and therefore can't do any more than make these type of speeches for whatever mobilizing effect they have. And go on vacations oh. in Bali. Yeah, and have vacations in Bali and, you know, tell these guys that they ought to be nicer people and that they ought to be giving iPhones to little kids in Kenya. Uh, and, and moreover, to make the claim that that gives them access to world knowledge and power. Well, it only does in the most passive sense, of course. Well, he sees the gross inequalities. He sees it's getting worse. Um, I think he's just dreaming, saying it's getting less violent. I don't know where he's been. Uh, he's clearly between the Iraq war, the Syria war, and endless yeah. war since World War II. I, I don't know what, what he's, this is, this is purely a song. Um, and then he has uh, uh, ideas of what the solutions look like and don't look like. And the next segment of our interview, we're gonna talk about Obama's view of the rise of the right and, and what he sees as the solution both to the inequalities and the rise of the right and, and how realistic that song is. So please join us for the next segment of our interview with Professor Leo Panich on The Real News Network.